So today, um, again, the, o, uh, the basic overview <coughs> of CS3, and I, I want to go through this quickly because as soon as we switch to CS4, the layout will be a little bit different. Um, the panels to the right will look a little different. The function of all of it is pretty much the same, but it just looks a little different. Now, you'll notice that my layout is going to be different than yours. I have some panels that are open here, some um, that need to be closed. <coughs> but if I go to a window and I go to workspace and I select default workspace, this is what yours should look like. If it does not, then what you need to do is go to window, workspace, and select default workspace right here. And when you do, it should look just like this. Okay? Now, one of the things that you'll notice when we switch to CS4 is that you'll no longer see the desktop behind all of this because it can you can see mine, it's pretty cluttered. And that could get in the way of color choices, of your ability to properly modify images. <coughs> so that will disappear. It will be a kind of a a single unit that covers the entire screen, which is kind of nice. So with Photoshop open, I have no file, excuse me, no file open, but I do have Photoshop open. So <coughs> to give you an idea, <coughs> to the left, <coughs> by default, we have all of our tools. Okay, and they're broken down into different categories. If you want to pull this off, okay, by clicking on this button here, which is probably a thing of the past. When you clicked on this little double arrow in the top, what it did is that it showed you the old way that Photoshop tools were displayed in a two column mode. You click this and in order to add real estate, um, it, they chose to change it to a single column mode. If you wanna move this someplace else, you can always click on the blue icon and drag it. And now you can click and drag and put it wherever you want it. Okay, and if you want to put it back in here, you'll notice that I highlight it. When I move it over, it sort of highlights and it snaps back over. I'll talk about when we start using the tools, what each of these groups does. Okay. <coughs> at the top, I'm not quite sure what they call this tab at the top here, but each of the, this, this bar along the top adds functionality to any of the tools that you may choose. If I select the ellipse selection tool, you'll notice it gives me a bunch of options here. It asks me what kind of tool I have selected. It tells me how I want this to, to function, whether I want it to be a simple selection or I want it to add it to an additional, to an existing selection, do I want it to be feathered, do I, meaning do I want a soft edge or a hard edge? Do I want anti-alias turned on? If there's a style to be applied, there's all sorts of things. Now, keep your eye on this bar, and as soon as I select the text tool, come on, it's probably gonna crash. That's what's gonna happen. There we go. Notice how it changes. So with every tool that you select, um, this bar should change somewhat dramatically, sometimes not. But again, it gives you all the functionality. Again, it shows us that this is the type, the tool that we have selected. Over here, it will show that this is the font that we have selected. And you can see that when we select it, we can see what the typeface, a sample of the typeface, what it looks like, okay? If there's additional versions of this, meaning regular, bold, italic, the point size, crisp, you know, strong, sharp, whatever we want. We have the column, whether it's flush left, centered, or flush right, and the color of the type, which is set to green right now, among other things. <coughs> and then over to the right, we have panels. <coughs> They're actually, they were called something different than panels. They are called panels now. I've already kind of put it out of my mind. <coughs> okay. And if you want additional real estate, you can click on this little double arrow here, and this collapses it. So all you do is you see 
the individual icons for each of the tools. And if you want to view, for example, swatches, you just click on it and you see the swatches that are available. And then when you're done with it, you just click it and it closes it up. So you have as, as much real estate as possible for your image. Okay, and we'll go over each of these. Actually, it used to be called palettes, but panels, palettes, whatever you want to call them. Um, but anyway, these two will add functionality to tools and give you a lot of information about what you're doing at any given time. Sometimes they add functionality, sometimes they do, sometimes they do some, something totally different, but they, these will be used in addition to this and in addition to these. Okay. <coughs> the first thing you do when you create a new file from scratch is you'll go to File and select New. So this is a blank canvas. This isn't opening a file. This is just creating a new blank canvas. You'll notice when you use any of the menus along the top, if there is a keystroke equivalent, it will be over to the right. The little clover leaf on the Macintosh stands for the command key. And you have one command key on either side of the space bar at the bottom of the keyboard. So to get a brand new file open, you hit command N for new. That prompts you with a dialog box. The dialog box allows you to name it at this time. And I'll just call it demo. We can customize the size, and it can be in pixels, it can be in inches, centimeters, whatever units you prefer. When I'm designing for print, I prefer inches. And what I'm going to do now under inches is I'll just name it, uh, I'll um, size it, and the width will be um, 10 inches, and the height will be 8 inches. The resolution for our class will be anywhere between 200 and 300 pixels per inch. You'll notice the resolution that I have selected here is 72. If you were in my web class, that would be the resolution we'd be doing for that. So print, just if you want to make notes, is generally between 200 and 300 pixels per inch. For the web, it's 72. So I'm going to go ahead and hit 300. <coughs> then we have background contents, option white. Background color, which would be a deep blue that's already selected in the lower left-hand corner, or transparent. White for, is fine for the default. Color mode RGB 8-bit is fine, too. The, si the physical size and the resolution are the most important components when creating a brand new file. Okay. Then you click OK, and voila, you have a white document here. And this looks much bigger than 8 by 10, doesn't it, on my screen? Don't be deceived by what you see on the screen. I can zoom out. And this also is 8 by 10. And you'll look at the rulers at the top, 0, 10. So you know that that's 10 inches. But when you actually look at the physical size of the ruler, it will either look smaller, almost the same size as an actual ruler, or bigger. If I zoom in, notice how the ruler gets much larger. As I scale the document up, from here to here is an inch. And then units between those inch become even finer and finer as I zoom in. As I zoom out, it's still 0 to 10, but I'm, I'm viewing the document at a reduced size. But this is still. When it prints, we'll print the ten, you know, 10 inches wide by 8 inches high. If at any time you're curious and you want to know exactly how big this thing is going to print and you're not sure, go to View and select Print Size. Boom. And then stretch this out. And this is pretty much, if you look at the rulers, you look at the paper size, it looks even on the monitor, pretty much 8 by 10. Okay, That's important because m monitors can only display 72 pixels per inch. So if you have a document that's 300 pixels per inch, how does it display it? It has to expand those pixels. And so your image 
when it said it set at 100%, you'll notice down in the lower left hand corner here, it says that I'm viewing this document at 24%. That's 24% of this of 100%, which is the screen resolution. So when I view this at 100%, that's not necessarily the print, the, the print size. Does that sort of make sense? When you view something at screen resolution and you have the document at 72 pixels per inch, it will look exactly as I have it here. So for example, if I go to image and I say duplicate. So here is duplicate demo and I zoom out. Actually, I'm gonna look at this at 100%. Look at how big the rulers are. But if I go to image and I select image size and I change this from, I leave the, 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 um, the, the physical size, the width eight or, ten, eight, by, or 8 by 10 or 10 by 8, and I change this to 72 pixels per inch, and I click OK. Now look at, these are both the same size, correct? But look in the lower left-hand corner. This one that's 72 pixels per inch, I'm viewing it at 100% because it's at screen resolution. This one I'm viewing it at 24% because the document is 300 pixels per inch and it can only display 72 pixels per inch monitors. So I can only see this at a high resolution image at a reduced size, complete on the screen. Doesn't completely make sense at the moment, but it will when you start to work with it, okay? This will be important later on. The other options that you have available to you too is that aside from viewing the document down here, you can also resize it from here. So if I wanted to see this at 150%, I could highlight it and I could say 150% and I could hit the tab key and I've resized it and you can see that now it's a little bit, it, I'm viewing it at 150%. Oops, there we go, actually the, the return key. So now it's look, I'm looking at it at 150%. So I can resize the window from there. I also have a lot of useful information that's available to me here, right next to the percentage. When I click on this little button here, where it says document size, 1.19 megabytes, that gives me the file size. When I click on it, it shows me how it's going to print on an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, ver printing vertically, you notice that part of it's gonna be cropped off. If I hold down the Option or Alt key and I click on it, it gives me even more information about the image. It tells me the width is 720 pixels or 10, 10 inches, the height is 576 pixels or eight inches. Channels, we're working in RGB resolution 72 pixels per inch. So it gives me a lot of really important information about this document. And I haven't had to look hardly anywhere. It's right there next to the image. And even though I have simply a white screen, pixels are pixels. Watch when I open up <coughs> another document <coughs> and I will also make it eight by 10 72 pixels per inch or 300 and we're going to compare the one that's all white with the one with the image. Which one do you think will have a bigger file size? Any guess? Hmm? They will have the identically the same size image. Pixels are pixels. White pixels count the same as colored pixels. So when I open one, I'll go ahead and open a file. And I'm going to go inside the hard drive. You don't have to follow along. I'm going to go inside applications. I'm going to go inside Photoshop. There's a sample folder. And I think this one might be a good one, DVD menu. Or how about this one, the doors? I'm going to open this one. And I'll go ahead and click open image, click OK. I'm going to look at the image size. This one is 8 by 12, 240 pixels per inch. So I'm going to go ahead and change this one to 10. It's 
so it's not quite 8 by 10, but it's only 240 pixels per inch. Now I'm going to change this to 300. Whoops. So I'm going to make some changes that you normally shouldn't do. <clears throat> I'm not going to constrain the proportions, which is a bad idea. And I'm going to make this 8 inches. So it's the same as the other, but this is 300 pixels per inch. But I have data in here, right? And you can see that it changes the proportions and everything a little bit. But if I look at this image, notice that this one is 20.6 megabytes. This one is 1.19. That's because this one is 300 pixels per inch. Watch what happens when I change this to 72 pixels per inch. When I go to image size, I'm going to go ahead and constrain proportions. And I'm going to change this to 72 just to prove my point. <clears throat> and you'll see that it's 1.19 megabytes. You'll notice the other one, 1.19 megabytes. Doesn't change. And when you look at this at 100%, they are identically the same size, file size. So pixels are pixels are pixels. Doesn't matter whether they're white or they're colored or black or anything else. They're all the same. Okay. Everybody with me so far? Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and close the close this. I'm going to close this. Close this. So one of the uh, some of the important menu items that you're going to be using from time to time <coughs> is that if you want to change any of the preferences, that for example, if I go back and I create a new file, and my ruler is inches, in inches, and you say, I don't want to see it in inches. I'm designing for the web. I want to see it in pixels. How do you change that? You go to Photoshop, and you go to Photoshop Preferences, and you'll notice that there's a lot of them here that you can actually toggle through. But if I choose to select here, and I select Units and Rulers, you'll see that it's right now. The rulers are in inches, but if I want to change it to pixels, click OK. Now notice how my ruler has changed. So you can always change these very quickly on the fly. So preferences will be changed a lot from here. Opening, closing, saving files will be, will be in the under the file menu. If you were at home and you're going to print from here, you would print from here. Page setup. Um, editing files can be done from here. Copy, paste, transform. A lot of those can be done from here. But notice that nothing is available yet because I don't have anything selected. Important um, tools will be found under the image menu. I have already used this considerably using the image size. This tells us in pixels, it tells us in inches or any other units of measurement, as well as the resolution of our document, how many pixels per inch it is. Simple rule of thumb, when you scan an image or you bring it in, <coughs> even though I increase the resolution, without changing the proportions, don't ever do that. It's a bad, bad idea. So if I go ahead and I cancel this, and let me open up an existing file again, like this mask image. Might be a good one. OK, oh shoot, come on. Didn't want that. OK, and I look at image size. And I see that this is at 100%, and it's only 5 by 6 inches. And I go, oh, shoot. And it's only 72 pixels per inch. I got this off the internet. What am I going to do? Well, I saw my instructor, you know, Kirk Miller, he changed this to 300 pixels per inch. And I'm going to do that now. It's 5 by 6 postcard size. That's the size I need it, but I need it at a higher resolution. So that should fix that. And I click that, and it doesn't fix a darn thing. All I've done is add pixels where um, it, it, took, it guessed. It didn't know what, what quality the pixels are or what kind of pixels it needed to add. It just added pixels. It guessed. So when I print this out, it won't look any better than the 72 pixel per inch image. None. The only way you can add resolution 
is by scaling the document. And that means if I start, <coughs> if I go back here and I revert to saved, <coughs> and I know that this sounds a little bit tedious, but this stuff is really important. Okay, so notice that this is only at 25%. Oops. So I have, this is at 100%, but if I go back to image size, okay, 72 pixels per inch. Well, what if I need it, an image at 300 pixels per inch? I need this to be 300 pixels per inch. So I'm going to go to image duplicate just to show you what happens. And I'm going to resize this image. I'll go to image, image size. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off resample. And notice that the width, the height, and the resolution are now linked to one another. This you can change now, because if you change one dimension, the other will change. When you change the resolution, the size will change accordingly. You're not adding pixels, you're not throwing them away. So now when I change this to 300 pixels per inch, notice the size of the image. It's only one by one and a half. That's all the data that I have in there. So now when I look at this, now why didn't it change? Didn't I say okay or not? I guess I didn't. 300. They're both at 100%. That can't be. Image size. <coughs> oh, yes, it can. I'm sorry. Never mind. No, it can't be. Can, it can't. Okay, let's select this one and let's go to view, print size. There we go. That's how you change. Change this one, view, print size. So pr my print size at 72 pixels per inch is this big one, but it's going to look really jaggy. You know, it's not going to look very clear. You're going to see the individual pixels. On the other hand, if I want a nice, cl clean, tight, high-resolution image of it, the biggest one I can get out of this is this one right here that's a little over an inch by an inch and a half. So that's the proper way of scaling images, to make sure that the, the size, the actual physical dimensions are linked, as well as the resolution. So if you change one parameter, one aspect of it, the others automatically change, and you're neither adding nor subtracting pixels from it, which is what I did before. <coughs> Not a good idea to do. So we're going to cover a lot of this more, but I do want, it doesn't hurt to talk about this now. <coughs> Next thing that you'll want to use from time to time will be the bridge. And over here, you'll see the button at the top that says BR. It's very tiny with a little uh, magnifying glass here. And if I select Go to Bridge and I click on that, it's going to launch a separate application. A bridge is a very um, a powerful application that's built into Photoshop that's used for organizing, previewing, um, doing a lot of different things with files. <coughs> Um, let me go ahead and open some documents now. What I'm going to do is I'm going to click on mine. You won't have this here, but I'm going to click on Miller. I'm going to look in my public folder. In my public folder, I have some Photoshop lessons here. These are the Photoshop PS3 lessons that I will give you. And I have in here, here's lesson one. And you'll notice that I have the before, the after. This is the before. If I close it, you'll notice I still have access to it. I can also um, click on here and even make it larger. And I'm not even opening it. I can rename it here. I can delete it from here. I can add metadata. I can view the metadata. And what metadata is, is this, especially if you have taken this with a digital camera, it's going to give us the file properties. It's going to talk about the camera itself down here. You'll notice if I can look at the camera type, and it tells me that this is a camera raw file. It tells me the camera itself, that this was taken with a focal length of 180 millimeters. The lens was um, a zoom lens, 70 to 300. Didn't use a flash. 
it says did not fire compulsory mode metering was patterned um, the white balance was automatic so on and so forth a lot of you know information more than you probably want to know it will also tell you the date and the time that the photograph was taken with digital cameras it will tell you the kind of camera that was used and so on and so forth there's all kinds of information that's built in there with some digital cameras they even have GPS built in, built in and it will tell you where on this planet that fit picture was taken within like a few feet it's amazing so this can get to you to where you want to be pretty quickly you notice that I'm looking and and this will be for us for today this will be lesson one show you some of the basic features in Photoshop and what I can do is I can hold down the shift key and I can hold s select the first one and the last one and notice all the rest are selected and I can double click on inside one of these and they will all open in Photoshop so that's one way of doing it I can also deselect and what if I wanted to open only some of them I can click on one hold down the command key and I can select every other one if I want or I can click again and only select a couple of them that's by holding down the command key the shift key allows you to select beginning and end whoops wrong key the command key allows you to select individual or deselect individual so that you can have multiples or just one so I'm going to select the first I'm going to hold down the shift key select the last and I'm going to open all six files so this is an introduction to bridge and it's something that you'll want to use quite a bit and this is also an introduction into the first lesson and it's a good example of the kinds of um, of files that you are provided in the back of your book on the CD again it's kind of like a cookbook approach they give you the before they give you the after here's the before here's the after <coughs> for that part <coughs> this one is the after is the before this one has type okay this one is the after okay so we have you know before after so you can compare I'll hide these by clicking on the amber key. This one's the before, this one is the after. So you can compare. And you can see this is what my file is supposed to look like. So, is a typical example of the kinds of things that you're going to do in Photoshop. <coughs> Will be to select particular regions of an image and you're going to do something to that image, part that part of the image or you're going to protect that part of the image and select something else you know do something else to it you'll notice in the final part of this image that the background is darkened and the coin is still light it hasn't been altered at all does that make sense okay so how do you do that how do you how do you isolate just the coin there's a lot of different ways that we can do that now and that we'll see when we start to use our tools is that the first group are selection tools and there are additional ways of selecting in parts of an image or an entire image but depending on what what kind of image or what part of an image we're going to select will be determined the kind of tool we're excuse me, going to use so for example <coughs> beneath this selection tool or move tool which is the black arrow you'll see I, um, uh, an ellipse Okay, this is the elliptical marquee tool. Hidden underneath that is a rectangular, and we have single row marquees. We have also the lasso tool. We have the polygonal tool, the magnetic lasso tool. We have the smart selection tool. We also have the magic wand tool down here. And we have the crop tool. This one for selecting look, looks like the X-Acto knife. That makes no sense in here but this is used for web design it's for slicing up images so pay no attention to that we won't use that in this class for the advanced students if you want to design a web page then you probably will okay so <coughs> in CS3 the the um, the quick selection tool was added and it is really really smart if I just wanted to select the coin, I could begin to click and drag in here, 
I notice it pretty effectively. And I can click, a, hold down the shift key to add to the selection and click again. And it did a pretty good job. You can see that that, see the little marching ants around the coin? That lets me know that just that coin is selected. It did a pretty darn good job. Um, before this tool, you didn't have too many choices. Okay, so that's, that's one smart choice. Another one would be is to come back and use the elliptical marquee tool. And how you use these tools varies depending on what you want to do. Typically, you click and drag diagonally and you can see the little marching ants selection that's made. Okay, that's one way to do it. Another way, if you want to make the selection from the inside out rather than diagonally, would be to hold down the option key and to click and drag. But notice that I am having a hard time constraining it. It's an ellipse and the coin is a perfect circle. So one of the other things that I would need to do to constrain it to make it a perfect circle would hold down the shift key. As I hold down the shift key, notice that it's creating a selection from the inside out, but it's a perfect circle, but notice it doesn't quite match my coin. I'm not dead center. It's hard to see. Can you see it okay? The selection behind me? Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm also, I have not let go of the mouse yet. I have not let go of the keys yet. I'm also going to hold down the space bar. Now that allows me to move this selection wherever I want. I'm going to recenter it, get it nice and centered, let go of the space bar and resize it just a little bit. Close enough for government work, okay? Now I let go of the mouse, and I have the coin selected. If I want to nudge it a little bit, I can use my arrow keys. Left, right, up, and down to make it fit, okay? There's even another tool that will let me resize this thing all together. I can also save the selection so that if I need to bring it up at a later date, I can do that. Lots of options for us. Now I'm ready to color the background. I want to leave this intact. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Image, Adjustments, lots of tools here. I can use Curves. Curves would be a way of doing this. And I can go ahead and I can adjust this. Notice that that lightens it. That's not what I want to do. This darkens it. That's not what I want to do either. I want the background affected, don't I? I wanted to leave the coin alone, but I wanted to affect just the background. So I need to cancel this and do something different. One of the things that you'll do often is that you'll select one thing when you want something else selected. It was easier to select the coin than it was to select the background. So by selecting the coin, I can now hit Shift-Command-I for inverse, or I can go to Select Inverse. Where is it? Right here. And now you'll notice a slight difference. Who can tell me what's different about what I had now versus what I had before? Right. Well, you see the, the marching ants around the coin, and you see it around the border of the image. So now that tells me it's not the coin that's selected, it's the background that's selected. It's the area around the coin. If I, was, if I had zoomed in, like so, <coughs> even further, and I could just saw the marching ants around the coin and not the, the border, I wouldn't know what is selected until I, I use, you know, use the tool. So sometimes it's easier to zoom out. You can either use the zoom tool over here, which is down here, the little magnifying glass, or we can use key commands. I'm using Command plus or Command minus. That's Apple plus or Apple minus on keyboard. And now I can go back to color balance. I can go to levels. There's any number of ways that I can adjust values in here. If I hit Command L for levels, this would allow me to make adjustments and lighten and or darken the image too. That's one way of doing it. I can go back to image adjustments and we can use curves, Command M, 
notice that I can click here and I can make this darker or I can click here and affect that. We have curves. Now in the book it tells us what settings to use. You know, so and I'm just changing it here just to show you. Notice that that look and if you ever get lost and I'm lost right now, I don't like what's going on. Hold down the option key and notice that it changes cancel to reset. I can reset it, and I can go back, and we can darken it. We can change output and input from here. There's all different ways of adjusting this. We can also, I can also go back. I can reset. I can select auto. Auto really doesn't change much at the moment. And this go, takes me back to my auto settings. Notice how it changes that. And as I said, I like using levels quite a bit. And I'll adjust this. Notice how it darkens. I can change from here to here. I can make it really dark and funky looking. OK. And when you're done, Command D to deselect, or Apple D. And I've left the coin alone and affected just the background. So that's one of the things that you're going to do frequently. <coughs> um, what I can also do is let's bring up these guys. In connection with the tools and some of the other selections that we're going to use, is another way of masking areas will be to do that in layers. And I can click on layers here, and I'm going to pull off the layers tab so we can see it a little bit more clearly. You'll notice that we have three layers here. We have the background layer, which is, if I toggle that off, it's the image of the, the guy. So I'll leave that off. And you'll see that we have the tie. And if I turn off, turn him back on, turn the tie off, you'll notice that we have a shape here. It's the design that's been turned off. Okay. So they're all separated. So they have done that for us over here. If we select this image, and I look at this, and you'll see <coughs> that we already have tie designs. So if I hold down the Option key and click on this, I just have a orange rectangle on top of everything. Okay, Hold down the Option key, click back. Now, watch what happens. I'm going to hold down the Option key, and I'm going to click over this where it says Tie Designs, and I'm going to turn this off. And I'm going to select the Brush Tool. And the Brush Tool allows, if I click from here, I can select from pixel sizes to work from here, maybe a 27 pixel, 28 pixel brush, hard edge brush. Okay. Now I can come in here, and if I start to click and drag, notice that it draws across the whole thing. That's not going to work for me, and it's also the wrong color. So I'm going to Command Z undo. Command Z is your friend. Um, you only have one undo. You have multiple undos if you use the history panel. But by default, Command Z, one undo, and that's it. To bring me back to my default foreground and background colors, I'm going to click this little button here. It's a little, this, that's what these colors stand for. Green is in the foreground, this blue is in the background. But if I click on this little button, it resets it to black foreground, white background. Okay, and once again, I'm gonna look up here and the opacity is set to 43%. That's the reason why you want this menu bar up here. Now I'll go back and set it to 100%. And when I click across, I get the right color, or and I can click, but oh shoot, it's not, you know, I have to be really careful when I get to the edge. How does that help me? It goes over the tie, and I want it to fit within the constraint confines of that, confines of that shape. Okay? I've already used up my three undo, or my one undo, so what do I do? I'm going to go back, and I don't see it here, but if I go to the window, 
and I select history and check it, it will come up. And notice that I can go back in time all the way to opening the file or the start when I'm back to the very beginning. This will save 20 steps and that's it. And once it uses up the 20 steps, then it starts deleting what you've done before. So it's not like Illustrator where you can have hundreds of steps. Yes? Good question. I don't think they've, it, that's changed that much, if I remember correctly. <coughs> there are other workarounds. I mean, I could, what I could do on here, and I'm going off on a tangent at the moment, is that I could <coughs> come in here and, um, and, and because I haven't done anything yet, I can always go back to here too and I can go back to any point in time. But watch what happens when I go back now and here's my image that I'm going to work on. So this is the mask and now if I paint on here, notice it only paints, even though I'm painting on tie designs, it's using this shape as a mask. Notice that how, watch my, my um, let me undo that. Look at my mouse, it's outside and I'm gonna click and drag and you don't see anything. I'm holding down the mouse, holding down the mouse. As Soon as it gets in there, it's using that shape as a mask. So that's another way to mask things to protect them. So you don't have to worry as you did as a kid and you were working with a coloring book and I said paint within the lines, you know, draw within the lines. There's lots of workarounds for that now. Either you can be sloppy and go over the edges or there are some very slick tools to allow you to, to work within the confines of, of, a, of a shape. So now I can come back <coughs> and I can also use the, bra the um, right bracket tool. And if I move over here, that's going to increase the size. Uh, I gotta find this on my keyboard here. Notice how it's making the tool bigger and smaller. There are some new tools in CS4 that allow us to change on the fly the hardness of the brush. Right now I can only change, with CS3 I can only change the size of it on the fly. I can also right click to get a new brush. I don't have to go up here, <coughs> so that's another shortcut. And I can come down here and I can find a nice, you know, maybe 45, maybe a little bit bigger, 60, 60 pixel brush that's nice and soft. So now I can come up here and I can click. And you can see how even though I go over the edge, what it allows me to do is that it uses that orange image down here as a mask. I can click here, I can click up here, I can try to you know, duplicate what they have and then click. Again, right click, maybe pick a smaller one, a smaller brush, um, 12, that looks about right, 12 pixels and I can click, click. Now I have a hard brush that I can click. And if I slip, you know, I can always Command Z or I can use my history. But every time you click the mouse, notice that you're using part of your history panel. So this is another way that you'll be working often is that you'll have shape layers that will be used as masks that will only paint. I mean, because also you'll, you'll, when I get done with this, watch what I'm doing here. I'm using the orange shape for two purposes. It will be the color of the tie, but I'm also using it as a mask. So when I finish my polka dots here, I think everything just looks swell here and I'm happy with it. Then what I can do is if I decide later on, you know what, I really don't want those dots after all, I can come up here to tie designs and I can turn it off. And I can create a brand new layer now that's linked to that layer and I can create a separate one that's maybe just stripes. So I could have a stripe tie and a polka dot tie in the same fashion. And I can turn it back on. So layers are going to be really important. Another tool that you're going to use frequently. Let me see where I am with time right now. I know I started a little bit late, but I want to make sure that I turn off the.
Oh, I have quite a bit of time left. Okay, 41 minutes. Is you're going to use the type tool. Type tool is this group is found in this group of tools down here, and all of these are your vector tools. Type tool. The type tool is a, a tool that's editable. That is can be sized and rescaled and will always look really good. Bitmaps will not. And these are bitmaps. What do I mean by bitmaps? When I look at any of these images, when I look at this and I zoom in, I'm going to zoom in here. See how you start to see the individual pixels? You don't do see that when you work with vectors. Vectors are defined by mathematics. You will not see individual pixels. That's why I will emphasize time and time again throughout this semester how you can and can't enlarge or reduce images. It's really critical because they're all linked to these individual pixels. So the other thing that we're going to do here, it's down here. We're going to go ahead and we're going to add some text. Okay. I just want us to say Monday's beach cleanup day. There's a whole bunch of things that we can do with type in here. Tools are really powerful. Oops. You can always, always push these back in here too. And click actions. So they can always be pulled off or they can be put back into this little. I can also pull this back out too if I'd rather see it this way. So type. Click the T for type. Then it tells me what typeface do I want to use. I can, all, I can go back to the default setting, which is Myriad. That may be what they have us using here. What typeface you use really isn't important. Um, here we have, where is it? Myriad, Myriad. Myriad Pro. We can determine whether we want semi-bold, bold, italic, black, regular. Select bold. We can select the point size from here. We can also use this little spinner to the right, and I'm going to come down to maybe 24 pixels. Or I can come in here and I can type it in, or I can select from some presets, 24 point, determine whether I want it flush left, centered, flush right. I'm going to pick flush left, and I can click anywhere in here. And as soon as I do, <coughs> I want to bring layers back up here. And I'm going to pull them off. Notice what happened. I have a layer above my background layer that's labeled T. T stands for type. And you know that it will be an editable type layer. So what does it say? Sunday you know, is trash pickup. Whoops. Made a cap. Let's go backspace. Trash pick up. Day, whatever it said with a period. And I look at it and I go, and I go ahead and can't, and let's, oh, it crashed. Oh no, Mr. Bill. Okay, let's start over again. Just with that. The whole thing crashed. It didn't like that. So I'm going to go back, and I can also open recent. I should be able to see. Um, does it have one of those? It doesn't because I didn't save it. So I could go back to bridge. That's a safe place to go. <coughs> I can go back to my particular folder. I can look inside um, my public folder, which is where I had it. Scroll down. Photoshop lesson, Photoshop one, and I wanted these two open right now. Open them up. And I'm sort of back to where I was. Okay, so let's try this again. Click T for type, click, and I'm going to look and see what does it say again. Monday is beach cleanup day. Monday is. Beach clean up. A lot of things I don't like. It's the wrong color, wrong type. 
It's also centered, but what if I go ahead and I click the checkbox and I'm happy with it? I can come back and I can use the move tool to move it wherever I want. And I go, that isn't working for me. So I can come back with the type tool again, make sure that the type layer is selected, select, select all, come back and change. So let's switch from Zepfino to maybe Garamong. Again, whatever typeface you choose is just fine. You can see all the type we have loaded in here. Garamon Pro, that looks pretty good. If I want to change the color, I can change that from here. If there's a particular color in my photograph that I like, what if there's a particular blue or purple? Notice that I can click and it's clicking whatever I find in the photograph. If I want the color of the, from the sand or if I want this orange color here, or this yellow color I can pick from there. I can pick from any color in my image. Click OK, select OK, and again, once again, hit v, v for move, move it in place, and I said, you know what? It's still not right, it's too small. So again, double click, oh, actually, hold on. Type, click inside, select all. Let's go ahead and use spinners to make it a little bit bigger. Maybe 48 point is the way to go. Click here, maybe a preset of 48. Maybe another color would be better. Click from here, maybe in the purple range. And I like that, and I click OK, and click the checkbox. So within a matter of seconds, I've changed the type a number of times, the, the color a number of times. If I notice that there is a typo, I can change that. If I want to add type, reduce type, I can do that. Lots of things that we can do to change. <coughs> so you can create in Photoshop. Not only can you edit photographs, you can create one sheets or ads, as they're sometimes called, with type. Lots of fancy effects. What I can also do from here is when I select the type tool and I have the type selected, you'll notice this little widget right here. So I can go to create warped text. And now I have some features here. I can arc it. Notice all the other widgets. I could have it bulge. You can do some really neat effects that are all editable. All the text in here is editable. It can be changed. So if I want to use any of these, I can. A little wavy flag, which might be kind of cool. Click OK. In addition to that, I have some other effects that are really cool that will be editable. Notice that this has that little icon attached to it now. It lets me know that I have attached that tool. In addition to this, I have some effects. I have some presets that I can use or I can go in and create my own. I have the effects window down here. Maybe I want to add a drop shadow. Select that. Notice a little drop shadow has been added. I can change the direction of the shadow. I can change the distance, I can change the thickness, softness, hardness, all kinds of stuff and all of these are always editable. I can also come down here and maybe I want to add bevel emboss. Now this will look a little bit more three dimensional. Click OK and now you'll notice down here that I can turn these effects on or off as I wish. I can throw them away, I can double click on them. And I can go back and I can always edit them. So there's lots and lots of things that you can do. The key, I think, to working in Photoshop, Illustrator, any of these programs, to try to think of ways of working in a non-destructive fashion. And they have tried to do that for you. And especially in CS3, CS4, almost with every version that's come out, they've added features so that you can now make changes and work in non-destructive you know, non-destructive modes. So you can always go back and edit and make changes and not make permanent changes so that you have to go back and redo everything. The key is oftentimes is to save often because if you don't save, then everything you've done goes away. When you reduce or remove your thumb drive, one of the things that you're going to want to do, I don't have a thumb drive in here, but you'll see the icon of it on your desktop. Click it. Like if this were the, the thumb drive, which it's not, it just click it and drag it in the trash, and what it does is it will eject it. 
When it's done flashing its lights and all that sort of thing, then you can pull it out. A keystroke for that would be to hit Command E, E for eject. That will be another way. If you leave it in there and your file is open and you just pull it out, not only will you possibly <coughs> or likely destroy your file, but you will destroy the drive as well and anything else that's on it. So you have to be very careful with it. Another reason that you will want to um, burn and back up your data on CDs, and we provide, that's part of your $10 that goes for lab fees that will allow you to back up your files. Okay? And I would do that on a regular basis because the thumb drives do fail from time to time. Um, it's 136. Let me see how many minutes again I have, and then I can either go to the next lesson. <coughs> um, it's going to be hard for you to do the lessons in your book because not all of the tools and the layout match CS4. <coughs> I have a half an hour left. So. Let me try to go through the next lesson, lesson two, quickly. When I'm done, what I will do is I'm going to turn off my video camera, turn on the lights, we can take a quick break, and then I'm going to show you where all of these, the files that I've been working on are on my computer, and you'll have access to them. You can try to follow along in your book, because it's similar to this one, but it's going to be slightly different. But you'll find some of the same features. Okay. Do your best. I'm not expecting you to finish anything, do anything much, other than to try to do it, because we're kind of in limbo right now with the software, what we should have and what we don't have. So <coughs> I'm going to go ahead and close some of these. I'm not going to save the changes. I don't need them. Come back here, and we go back to um, set of lesson one. I'm going to go back into all of these lessons, and I'll open lesson two. And I have a beginning and an end file. And if you've looked in your CS4 book, this lesson is very similar. Just a different image is all they've used. <coughs> the start file is a typical file that you would use to begin with, one that you've scanned on your own, one that you got back from a, a of, uh, you know, using traditional film rather than digital film. And when you put it on this, the flatbed scanner, you know, it's slightly skewed and there's slightly problems with it. Well, you want to straighten it up. There's a couple of ways to do that. The easiest way to do that um, is to go to image. <coughs> uh, wait a minute. It's under file adjustments or image adjustments. Automate. I think it's, wait a minute, crop and straighten photo under file automate. And because it has a nice white background, you'll notice that it now created another copy of it. And I can close the original, and it straightened it for me, didn't it? It cut out the background, a little bit glitch over here, not too, but not too bad. We can also use the crop tool to do that. So that's the first thing you do, crop it, straighten it up. The other thing is you'll notice that there's a color cast. Also, if you compare it to the final version, you don't have the same degree of lightness or darkness. So another, a couple of other things that you're go going to want to do is you're going to want to add adjustment layers. Um, they don't have you use adjustment layers as far as I know, but you will be using them exclusively in CS4 because they are... Um, non-destructive. <coughs> so where you find those is over here in your layers panel. And I'm going to click down here. It's this little circle that's half white, half black. And I'm going to start by selecting levels. And I'm just going to do this quickly, and I'm going to go over this again on Monday. So don't worry about this. Only I'll, I'm hopeful that I will be able to use CS4, not CS3, to do the exercise that's in your book. Now I can select Auto. And you'll notice it automatically adjusts, adjusts the levels. It's a little bit lighter, a little bit more contrast, and I can even push that further here. 
Notice that I can adjust this like so. I can move the light, the, the white point. I can move move the dark. And if I want to see what this looks like when I'm done, if I hit Command Z, notice that that's what it looked like before. That's what it looks like now. Still, there's a bit of reddish tint or cast over the whole thing, isn't there? <clears throat> I can also turn this off here because I have I've used an adjustment layer that leaves the settings for me. I can now add another adjustment layer, only this is going to be for color balance. Because the, with traditional old film, and depending on your, the settings that you have in your cameras, what, even if they're digital, the color is going to be off. And you'll notice that this overall is quite a bit of, of reddish tint. So I'm going to come down here and use an adjustment layer again. <coughs> and I'm going to use my, if I can find it here, color balance. And, no, I don't want to do that. I'm going to try something different. I can do that. I guess I could. And let's say, let's move towards the cyan a little bit. And if I move toward the cyan, I'm going to move a little bit toward the green. And I'm taking too much of that out. There should be a little bit. I want to try to match what we have in the photo a little bit. Maybe a little bit more yellow. So this is one way to do it, and the book's not going to tell you to do it this way. But I'm going to save this, and this looks like a pretty good match, doesn't it? If I turn this off, another way to do this would be to go to Image Adjustments, and I can select Auto Levels instead of what I did before. I can also select, <coughs> if I have the right layer selected, I could come down here and I could go to Image Adjustments and select <coughs> Auto Color too. And that will change, that will take the color cast out of it too. But you'll notice I don't have the editable settings over here. <coughs> In CS4, they've changed that quite a bit. So now I can turn this back on and I have a pretty good match here. Um, we're also going to, you'll notice on the sculpture back here that in the final version, we pumped up some of the highlights and we've made some of the, the shadows darker so we can use the dodge and burn tool. You'll also notice the tulip in the foreground. In the original, it's yellow. We can change that to any other color we want. How we do that is we can start by using the selection tool, select a rectangular marquee tool, and make a little selection around the tulip. Then I can go to image, and I can go to adjustments, and I can say um, replace color. And now what we can do is we can select image instead of seeing the selection. And I can click from here. We can adjust the fuzziness a little bit in a minute. I can click here. And we can adjust the fuzziness just a little bit. Now I can go back to selection. And we can see that I have the tulip selected. We can begin to add to the selection. And before you know it, we're going to have mostly the tulip selected and nothing else. If I go outside it, I can always fix that. That's good enough for our purposes. And now I can come in here and notice how I can change the color. See how the, the, the tulip is changing and nothing else? So if you wonder in car ads how they're able to <coughs> change colors on the fly, it's a lot of the same tools and techniques without having to re-photograph it. Pretty nifty. So here I have, I've changed um, the hue. I can also maybe pull back on the saturation a little bit, make it a little bit more neutral, not so intense. And I click OK, and there I have it. I've deselect Command D, and I've changed the color of my tulip. Not too bad. I can also increase the intensity of colors. I can also, as I said, I can pump light into shadows, or I can darken shadows, or I can do all sorts of things. The dodge and burn tools are here. I can adjust the exposure, and I can control just highlights. So with the, the, if I do the highlight tool, I can come in here, and we can go ahead and we can make sure I have the right layers selected. And I'm just going to, you can see that I'm enhancing the highlights a little bit here. And I'm hand painting a little bit. And it's improved a whole lot in CS4. It's 
So I'm just affecting highlights in here. And I'm trying to make it, they really went overboard with it in the demo here. I can also select the burn tool and make the shadows darker. So instead of dodge, I'm gonna select burn and I'm gonna come back again and I'm really gonna push the shadows in here and make them a little bit darker. Instead of, yeah, I got shadows selected. Really push this and make this a lot darker under here. Really enhance, make, you know, add a lot of contrast to the shadow side. As I said, maybe I want, you'll notice in the final that the flowers look a little bit more intense. The green looks a little bit brighter. <clears throat> you wanna be careful about what you do here, but we have the sponge tool and it can be set to desaturate or saturate. If I select the desaturate and watch, I select this at 100%, watch what happens. It turns it into a gray image, doesn't it? It takes, it's just sucks all the color out of it. And if I switch to saturate and maybe turn it down to 20% so that the flow isn't so great, and let's use the right bracket key to really increase the size of my brush here. Now I can come back in here and very lightly come back to enhance. And before you know it, it brightened it. And the, the colors are more intense. To compare, if I hit Command Z, Command Z, notice how it's changed a little bit. Subtle, subtle change, but important change. Probably one of the other things that I should have done that I didn't do, that I don't remember if they have in the textbook or not, but when you scan an image, it will automatically blur it slightly. So what you'll have to do is use something called Unsharp Mask, and that might be one of the last filters that you use. So when you're all done, it will be sharpened, Unsharp Mask. You can adjust it, and if you really go overboard with it, it's gonna look really nasty. You can come back and adjust it a little bit, and when you click here, you'll notice a subtle little difference. I can go all the way up just to really make it dramatic, maybe like 100% click here. You'll notice that it looks blurred when I click. When I release, it looks crisp. It adds contrast between pixels. It doesn't really sharpen it. When I click OK, now it looks really intense and bright. You know, the whole thing looks. So this, in a nutshell, I went over this very quickly, would be some of the basic techniques that you would use when you scan an image or you bring an image in, even one that may be digital to start with. You're gonna make some color adjustments, some adjustments in white point, contrast between light and dark, <coughs> sharpen up images, change colors of images, all kinds of stuff. Make sure that it's the way you want it and then save it. Okay. So lots of really basic tools covered right now that you'll use a lot on a day-to-day -day basis. If you do nothing else with Photoshop, you will use it for these tools. When we get through the basics, then you'll do some of the fun stuff. You know, once you retouch your image or get it to where you want it, then you can add all kinds of fun art, art filters and you can add some effects and some you know, compositing techniques that really make Photoshop what it is. You know, make, create some really, a really interesting design, and illustration, a painting tool. Okay? So I'm gonna <coughs> turn off my video recorder and then if there's questions or there's things that you want me to redo, I will. And I'm also going to show you where the files are on my computer so you can grab those old files. <coughs>